A ja sobi čornjavo Lopis ja spodo a group from Toronto called Dunai, and uh, they've been around for quite a while, uh, going back to the 1990s when we played them on our first incarnation of Nash Holos back in the 90s, and uh, back then they had a couple of CDs out, and they've recently put out, uh, about a year or two ago, put out another album, and uh, this song is from that most recent album. It is a traditional Ukrainian folk song. Zadunayim, which translates as Beyond the Danube River, and uh, done up in a rather more contemporary fashion, as you heard. Dunai from Toronto, Ontario, with Zadunayim. Dobry den, shinovni radio, suchachi tavi tayu vas vsih na radio peredachu nash, holos radio, krinskoho korinja. Jaka podejeci vam si hojni, tak jaki kožni serede, zudinaci toj do trinaci toj hodene, na radio stanci CHLY, stojdeni sim FM, umisti nanajmo. Pri mikrofoni si hodenu je Pavlina, a na stupnu hodenu budu zvame Oksana. Jako ju štorišale per budu znamen na stupnih dvoh hoden, me majmo dužici kavi novene na sudnišni prošami. Hello there and welcome to Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio coming to you on CHLY 101.7 FM in Nanaimo. I'm Paula demchuk Makori, Pokrinska Pavlina, and I'll be your host for this first hour. Oksana will be here at 12 noon to host the show in Ukrainian. I'm delighted to have you with us. We've got a great program lined up for you in this hour, episode 6, and the last in Joan Brander's a podcast series on Piss and Ke, and uh, she'll be giving you some pointers on different kinds of Easter eggs if you're running out of time to make pisenka for this Easter. As well, we've got Ukrainian Jewish heritage and an interview with a woman who works with 
an organization that works to help improve the lives of women in around the world and the Ukrainian branch, of course, in Ukraine. And she'll be telling us all about her and her grandfather's work establishing or rebuilding the Jewish community in Kriviri, Ukraine. As well, we've got our usual proverb of the week, other items of interest, and great Ukrainian music. And coming up next is a song by a Winnipeg singer by the name of Sofia Bilozor. And here she is with Tsihanich Komoya, My Gypsy Girl.
čomu, čomu temni noći, oj peki koraki. Čomu, čomu temni noći, oj peki koraki. Oj se hanko čorni oči, po cilujki jak me zomaki. Čomu, čomu temni noći, oj peki koraki. Čomu, čomu temni noći, the Euphoria Band from Edmonton. This is from uh, their first album that was released last summer and debuted at, uh, launched, I guess, at Canada's National Ukrainian Festival in Dauphin. And that song was another one about gypsies, and that was called Sehanska. Coming up next, another Canadian, this one from Toronto, Stephanie Yerfameva with a group called Dovira. And her contemporary remake of a traditional Ukrainian folk song, Tizhemena Pidmanula, You Deceived Me. Казала у вівторок, поцілуєш разів сорок, я прийшов тебе на Vyslúchajte rádio programu Náš holos rádio Krínskoho Kuríňa na radiostancii CHLY 101 CMFM umístené najmo. Hovoriť Palina. 
You're listening to Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio, coming to you on CHLY 101.7 FM in Nanaimo. I'm your host, Pavlina. Hi, I'm Joan Brander, and you're listening to my Pesinka Power podcast. I love Ukrainian egg decorating. I've been doing it for several decades, ever since I was a child. I've amassed so much knowledge and experience over those years, I thought that podcasting would be a great way to share my passion with you. I'll be telling you about their history, legends, and symbols. On the practical side, there's tools and techniques used in making them, hints, tips, and do-it-yourself projects to talk about. Did you know that the fate of the world depends on Pesinka? There's an ancient Ukrainian legend that says, as long as Pesinka are being made, evil will not prevail over good in the world. They're one of the greatest traditions of all time, so I hope that my podcast will inspire you. Thanks for tuning in. This is Episode 6, another chapter on the history and legends of Pesinke. I'd like to get this in before Good Friday and give a shout out to different types of Ukrainian decorated eggs. I touched on this in Episode 3. If you're still sitting on the fence and not sure if writing Pesinka is for you, or if the clock is just running out before Easter, here's some other methods you can try. Six other types of Ukrainian decorated eggs. Ones for eggs that can be eaten, and ones that use different or unusual techniques. Before I even get started on the contents of this episode, I gotta confess that there will be many foreign words I will most likely mispronounce. I'm not fluent in my inherited Ukrainian language, other than a few words of greeting, and of course, I'm okay saying the words pesinka and pesinka. Speaking of that, I thought this would be a good time to tell you the correct way to spell and pronounce these words. Throughout three decades of working in my store and answering questions, I've heard so many versions and seen many misspellings. It sometimes makes for very comical communication. I mentioned in episode 1 that pesinka is the singular for Ukrainian eggs using the wax-resist method to write traditional folk designs. The word is spelled P-Y-S-A-N-K-A. The word pesinka is the plural. It's similarly spelled, but with a Y at the end instead of an A. So it's spelled P-Y-S-A-N-K-Y. The accent is on the second syllable. An easy way to remember how to say it is that the first and third syllable rhyme. So that's the pe and the ke. Put it all together and you get pesinke. Many other Eastern European ethnic groups decorate eggs for Easter. The weeks before Good Friday are overflowing with egg decorating of all kinds. I've seen and heard people refer to painted wooden eggs, or eggs decorated using stickers or shrink wrap sleeves, referred to as pesinke. But that's just fake news. As I explained in episode 2, pesinke are unique to Ukrainians. A trained eye can tell the difference. I'm all about authentic pesinke, so you won't hear me talk about knockoffs. I always defend a true pesinke. But I digress. We're supposed to be talking about types of Ukrainian decorated eggs, other than the wax-resist pesinke. So, here's my list of six other types. First, there's krasinke. These are boiled eggs that are dyed a single color with edible dyes. Examples of these are vegetable dyes, like those you would get from onion skins. These types are blessed and eaten at Easter. Krapenke are considered the simplest version of a pesinka. In episode 1, when I talked about what the beeswax is used for, we imagined dropping melted beeswax from a candle onto an egg, then dyeing them one or two colors. The result was dotted or spotted eggs. These are called krapenke. The beauty is in their simplicity. Then there's eggs that are decorated by scratching designs and patterns on the surface of a dyed egg with a sharp knife or blade. This reveals the white shell below. I'll try to say the word. These are called derapanke. I've seen some designs that are very detailed. There's a technique that coats an egg entirely with melted beeswax, letting the beeswax harden and then embedding tiny colorful beads into the wax. 
I've made some of these using seed beads. Those are the small round ones, glass beads, and bugle beads. Those are the oblong beads in geometric patterns. There's such a great texture to them. This would be similar to a technique called wax embossed, where hardened beeswax is left on the egg. The way it's done is that after your pesenka is finished, you have areas of color. You outline these areas with beeswax, still using a kiska. It creates a dark outline. Keep in mind that the outline will be dull and bumpy because it's made of beeswax, but that doesn't detract from the beauty of the egg. Lastly, another technique I've done is using leaves and flowers to resist edible dyes. So, instead of using beeswax to resist the dyes as is done with pesenke, I used plants to resist edible dyes. These types of eggs can be eaten. Although not traditional in the true sense of the word, in recent years, new forms of egg decorating have become popular in Ukraine. I've tried some of these just for fun. For example, I've decorated eggs by drilling holes and other shapes in the surface of an egg to create cutout areas. I'd love to show you examples rather than tell you about them. If you ever drop by my store, you're invited to look at my personal collection. If that's not possible, I do have some video clips and photos on my website, babasbeeswax.com. So, I've covered the three topics I wanted to share with you. Maybe one of the six different types of decorated eggs will arouse your curiosity. I hope you learned something new and easy you can do in time for Easter. Check out my website, babasbeeswax.com, to learn of upcoming events in your area. Whether you're taking in an egg decorating class in your local church or community center, or enjoying an egg hunt with the kids, I hope you have a joyful and blessed Easter. So, in practicing my Ukrainian language, may I give you my ancestral Easter greeting, Hristos Voskres. I'm going to move on now to the segment I call Books and Bits. In each episode of this podcast, I've been commenting on sources of information relating to the Pesenka topics covered, such as this one on other types of Ukrainian decorated eggs. You can learn about these resources in this commentary or on your own on my website, babasbeeswax.com. I wrote a Pesenka bibliography, which was published by Babas Beeswax in 2007. It lists hundreds of resources for all types of Ukrainian egg decorating. The name of the book always brings a smile to my face and to others who understand the double meaning of the word written in the subtitle. The title of the book is About the Pesenka, with the subtitle It is Written. The first play on words is the fact that the book is a bibliography, and many books are written about Pesenka. The second play on words is the phrase I have repeated in every episode of Pesenka Power podcast this far, that Pesenka are written. Do you get the double meaning? The book is available from my store, Baba's Beeswax, Amazon.com, and Ukrainian bookstores. And for those who like to read books online, it's also available as an ebook. Just go to babasbeeswax.com to see the details there. Right beside the listing of the book on the Baba's Beeswax online store is an icon which links you directly to a book preview on my YouTube channel. There's several playlists on the YouTube channel, each covering different topics, from how-tos and DIYs to fun stuff, and a peek into the workings of Baba's Beeswax. I hope you watch some of them. But the particular playlist I'd like to point you to is the book previews. You can watch a brief video clip that flips through the pages of About the Pesinka, It is Written. You can see inside the book its format, colorful cover and pages, and contents of featured resource books. I'm so proud that I was invited to the first Pesinka Symposium in Washington, D.C. to launch this book and to receive a mark of distinction from the Library of Congress. It was such a thrill for me. There's a video clip and photo montage of this in the events playlist. I hope you've enjoyed these pre-Easter episodes and that they've inspired you to do something more creative with your egg decorating activities. I'm taking a break from recording until after Easter. 
In these first six episodes of my podcast, I've just touched the surface of Pesinka. Please check back. There's so much more to talk about when I return. Before I go, allow me to tell you about Baba's Beeswax and how you can get in touch with me. Back in 1991, sitting around the dining room table with my family, it got me thinking that, well, maybe I should do more with my egg decorating hobby. We came up with a whimsical name, Baba's Beeswax. Since then, Baba's Beeswax has been doing a lot of buzzing. We have a website at babasbeeswax.com. Our studio comes alive with workshops and demonstrations. We write books, pamphlets, teaching aids, and videos. We have a library for all the publications we produce and collect. Not only that, we have a gallery of all the pesenke we've made and collected. Please drop by for a visit. We're located in Richmond, British Columbia. If you like shopping in person, it's very easy to get to. We're not far from the Vancouver International Airport. And for our American friends, we're just a few hours drive north of Seattle. For shopping on the internet, you can visit our online store at babasbeeswax.com. We've had it since 1997. Pardon the pun, but we've been buzzing around for a long time. We're doing our best to keep up with technology, so we're connecting with you on YouTube, Facebook, and other platforms. Now we're podcasting, and we're very excited to be doing that. You too can follow the buzz by giving us your comments or a thumbs up. We're here to help you choose kits and supplies, like the beeswax, kiska, and dyes you'll need. You can get everything you need all year round, not only at Easter. In case you missed anything, you can listen to my podcast again. We've put the audio file on our website, babasbeeswax.com, or you might like reading along, so we've put the transcript there too. That's it for me, Joan Brander of Baba's Beeswax. Thanks for listening, and have a great day. From Montreal, a girl group that's been around a long, long time that was Cherimshena with a traditional Ukrainian folk song, Cherispola Sherokea, Across the Wide Field. And now for a look at Ukraine's rich Jewish heritage, then and now, brought to you by the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter based in Toronto, Ontario. Vlada Nedek is Director of Programming for Project Kesher Ukraine. Project Kesher is a network of women's groups that works to improve the status of women in the former Soviet Union. Starting in the Jewish community, Project Kesher Ukraine then builds interfaith networks of women, 
NGOs, and government institutions. These networks collaborate in such areas as women's leadership, health initiatives, gender violence advocacy, vocational training, stopping human trafficking, and promoting tolerance. Vlada has been instrumental in establishing these programs, which have improved the lives of thousands of women in Ukraine and other countries of the former Soviet Union. She has been with Project Kesher for over 20 years in various capacities. Starting as a volunteer in 1997, Vlada graduated from a Project Kesher Ukraine Leadership Seminar for Teens, and then went on to play a leading role in organizing the Jewish community of Krevirich, Ukraine. She developed and ran the first Jewish women's and youth groups in this city. Today, the community is one of the ten largest Jewish communities in Ukraine, with more than 5,000 members and an active synagogue, Jewish day school, and community center. Vlada kindly agreed to chat with us via Skype from her home in Krevirich, Ukraine. So thank you, Vlada, for joining us today. You've got an incredible resume. That, what I just read, just touched on the things that you do. And I you know, hope that uh, we'll be able to speak again in future interviews about some of the incredible work that you do in women's health in the former Soviet Union. But what I wanted to talk to you about today is your work in Krevirich. You, that's your hometown. You've lived there all your life, I presume? Yes, absolutely. I was born in this city, and uh, all my life I stayed in Krivoy Rog. Okay, and uh, our, our pronunciation is a little bit different. <laughs> Krivoy Rog, it's in Ukrainian, right. and in Russian it's Krivoy Rog. Right, and you speak both languages and English and Hebrew and Yiddish? Uh, no Hebrew, and I'm more in Russian, but I'm good with Ukrainian and English. Okay. Where did you learn to speak English? It was the idea of my grandfather. When I was 10 years old, he found uh, the women. She was a mentor in my English additional school course. It was um, still Soviet Union, and it wasn't popular uh, to have really advanced English program or advanced uh, education. Uh, that's why it just was uh, one of idea of my grandfather to develop me as a person. And after the school, I entered our pedagogical university and my speciality was English literature and Russian language and literature. Okay. Now, your grandfather obviously had a lot of vision and he had a lot of faith in you. And he started to redevelop the Jewish community in Krevirich. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. So, so tell us how that all started. Um, he was born in a really little shtetl close to Krivirich, and his parents moved to, to the city when he was six or seven years old. It was a large family, and his family was very simple. I mean, it was simple people with uh, secondary education, I mean, just school. And my grandmother, her roots, they were from Leningrad, St. Petersburg, uh, from Russia, and uh, her family came to Krivoy Rok. Her father, my grand-grandfather, he was main engineer, the first main engineer of mining ore factory here. Hmm. Uh, Krivoy Rok, it's, uh, how to say, it's middle heart of Ukraine. It's a really industrial center with a lot of mining work industry and the first people as you understand who developed this industry were Jews including my grand-grandfather and after the war my grandfather met my grandmother and they had family and he said that all his life he learned from these people he took a lot of ideas he got his education he entered communist party to make his career as a person at the factory uh, the main engineer of the whole factory. And he uh, he worked for 56 years uh, at one uh, factory. He, he really have uh, the idea of development of this industry. And he was really, how to say, uh, appreciate uh, everything he achieved during his life. His, uh, his wife's family came from St. Petersburg, as I said to you, and they have some of Jewish attributes. They have cedar, they have candle, and he saw some of Jewish tradition, not in his family, but in the family of his wife. 
and he was really interested in this and he said that it will come one day he will practice and he will be more close to his history and it happened when the jewish um, agency and its famous international organization who support jewish life all around the world and he went with some people who asked him if he can help to collect the list of all Jewish surnames, uh, the people who lived close to him, the people who worked with him at the factory. And they just asked him to find especially uh, Jewish roots like Goldsberg, um, Feyerman, uh, Verkhovsky, all surnames that sounds like Jewish. Um, this Jewish organization asked him to compile a list of names of Jewish people in the Krevirich area? Yes, absolutely. Uh, they planned to support people with some kind of food or to support with some kind of Jewish attributes. It wasn't even the idea to collect people, to educate people. They just find in Jewish families and mainly they were interested in old Jewish people who came through Great Patriotic War, who were survivors from Holocaust. And it was late middle of 80s. My first class at school, I was like seven years old. It was 1987, 1988. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was still Soviet Union. It wasn't independent Ukraine. And I remember how my mother say to my grandfather, oh, it's, it's not good, it's dangerous. We never say you should remember it. It's not good for all of us. But my father say that um, he really feel that it's some kind of new ideas. It's some kind of support and it will not be dangerous for all of us. So your father said this or your grandfather? My grandfather. I have never met with my father. My mother all was alone. And that's why I'm so close with my grandfather, because he really was meaningful during my childhood, during my school years. He helped me to enter the university and to find Project Kesher, because in 1998, in 10 years, when we have... Jewish Community Center, Project Catcher, invited young women for the first young leadership retreat in Kiev. And he said, you know, I'm ready to go, but I'm not young Jewish women. <laughs> That's why it will be interesting for you. I was the second year's student and I was really open to everything new. And Kiev as the capital, I've never traveled to the capital of Ukraine. And I say, yes, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm really happy to go. So in the mid-1980s, he was approached by this organization and began to reconnect with the Jewish people in the area, mostly Holocaust survivors. That was the original target. Absolutely. And your mom thought this was dangerous, but your grandfather said he didn't think so. This was the mid-80s, so you didn't see the collapse of the Soviet Union coming, or did you? I did. I remember the TV program and we saw some kind of movie and then everything stopped and extra news that in Moscow on Red Square there were tanks and something happens. And during the summer I stayed at home because the previous summer I went to Pioneer's Camp. But this summer my family left me during the whole summer alone at home. The camp was on Black Sea, far from home, and my grandfather said, you know, I don't want to lose you if something will happen. Just stay at home during the summer. And I remember it was the most terrible summer for me. I stayed for a long time, days and days at home. And your grandfather, uh, had he already started on this project to connect with the, uh, the Jewish people in the area? He started with uh, the list of people, and they established some kind of office. The first thing I remember, it was matzah. 
a lot of uh, boxes with matzah. Sorry, what's that? It's for Pesach. It's some kind of bread. Oh, the matzah. Uh, okay, the matzah. Yeah, the matzah. I remember that uh, my first visit, it was one big room <laughs> with a lot of people, with all staff, with uh, volunteers. And I remember this a really great number of boxes with matzah. And <laughs> I asked to my grandfather, what's this? And he said, oh, it's so tasty, Sin. I will make a lot of dishes to you. It's special bread for one holiday. And I just remember that it's some kind of special of bread and you can taste. It was cool because it wasn't salted, it wasn't sugar. It's very simple and something new for me. Okay. It was some kind of adventure because... When we came there, my grandfather never said to my mom because she was still feeling that it's dangerous. But I know that every weekend we took two trams because we have no car. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to this place and it was like some kind of secret to me uh, with my grandfather. And I really enjoyed the people because everybody was so nice, so polite. They discussed something. And at one moment, I remember that my grandfather said, I'm going to St. Petersburg. It was Leningrad. It was still Leningrad. I'm going to Leningrad. I have a course of Torah, uh, Torah education. Hmm. And uh, we asked with my mom, what is it Torah? What do you mean? What will you learn? And he said, it's special, it's scroll, it's a Jewish book. I have no idea what is it Bible. It wasn't popular. Now we have different congregations. We have different religious party. Everything is open, Christian, Catholics, um, all variety. But for that moment, Bible, I have no idea what is it Bible. Wow. And he said that it's, it's very ancient and it's all Jewish history. What I understood that he will learn uh, all Jewish history. And I, I really proud that my grandfather will learn all Jewish people from all, all history. And he said that it's the history of 2000 years. And we are here to get this history and to transform to send it to the next generations. It's really what I understood from this communication with him, uh, child memories. It was 1991-1992. Yeah, I was 11, 12 years old. When the Soviet Union collapsed. And so by that time, then, he had established this, this network and this sort of gathering where people discussed things and reminisced and learned about, uh, learned or relearned about their heritage? Yes. Okay. And mm -hmm. so then the Soviet Union collapsed and this, this organization already happened and he was going to St. Petersburg right around that time? Uh, absolutely. After the Soviet was broken. And I remember that he took the plane to St. Petersburg and he spent two months. I know that he, he took a long vacation uh, at the factory to spend two months at this course. And we have these great photos, which is still in Jewish community, where he was, uh, I was, was surprised with the, this special kippah on his head because he never did it in Krivorok, even in Jewish community. He never put a kippah on his head. Oh. And he was uh, close to Torah. He was in uh, Talit. And I understood uh, or uh, felt uh, that it's something special. When he came back from Leningrad or St. Petersburg? Yeah. Uh, he joined two women who arranged Shabbat services. They made some kind of holidays. It wasn't just humanitarian help what they started with uh, just to support people with kind of some kind of food some kind of like stuff and then they made this programming jewish traditions they have literature club and i remember that we started with hebrew lessons it was still a little room it was like ground floor uh, not first floor uh, ground floor floor of the building uh, like in a basement. 
like basement, absolutely, without any special sign in that it's here is Jewish community center. No, 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 no. Uh, it was uh, no sign, uh, just people know that they know. <laughs> so it's kind of almost a secret hideaway where people went to reconnect with their Jewish heritage. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And so this was the beginning of the the revival of the Jewish community in, in your community in Kleberich. Yes, yes. It, it's my child memories, how everything started and uh, different stages of uh, how the community developed. And the next stage, I remember that they went to local mayor, like city hall, town council, and uh, they officially registered Jewish community of uh, Krivi I'm speaking with Vlada Nidak, who is Director of Programming for Project Kesher Ukraine, a network of women's groups that works to improve the status of women in the former Soviet Union. As we just heard, Vlada's grandfather was instrumental in rebuilding the Jewish community in Krivi after the destruction caused by the Nazi and Soviet regimes. Vlada continues his legacy. Please join us for part two of our interview to learn the details of her work with the Jewish community in Kreviri. I'm Pavlina, producer and host of Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio. Until next time, Shalom. Ukrainian Jewish Heritage is brought to you by the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, based in Toronto, Ontario. To find out more about their work, visit their website and follow them on Facebook and Twitter. Transcripts and audio files of this and earlier broadcasts of Ukrainian Jewish Heritage are available at their website, ukrainianjewishencounter.org, as well as at the Nasholos website, www.nasholos.com. Radio Programu Nash Holos Radio Krinsko Ho Kurinia Nachveli CHLY Stoedeni Sima FM Umistin Naimo Primakrifoni Tsuhodenu Ia Pavlina. You're listening to Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio on CHLY 101.7 FM in Naimo. I'm your host for this hour, Pavlina. <laughs> what's happening this week in central vancouver island's ukrainian community 
The parishioners of St. Mary's Ukrainian Orthodox Church in Parksville invite you to join them for services every first and third Saturday of the month at 10 a.m. Afterwards, enjoy fellowship in the hall, special events and commemorations, plus you can stock up on homemade pierogies and pies from noon till 1 p.m. St. Mary's Ukrainian Orthodox Church is located in Parksville at 594 Carl's Way. For more information and for the schedule of their Palm Sunday and Easter services, follow St. Mary the Protectress Ukrainian Orthodox Church on Facebook. The parishioners of St. Michael's Ukrainian Catholic Church invite you to Divine Liturgy on Saturdays at 11 a.m., followed by Fellowship in the Hall. St. Michael's Ukrainian Catholic Church is located at 4017 Victoria Avenue in Nanaimo, just off Norwell Drive. For this coming Easter weekend, on Good Friday, April 19th, there will be Vespers at 5 p.m. with laying out of the Plashtunitsya Shroud. And the Easter Sunday service will take place on Saturday, April 20th, starting at 11 a.m. with Paschal Matins, followed by Divine Liturgy and Blessing of Pascha and Easter Baskets. The Visna Ukrainian Dancers rehearse every Tuesday evening from September to June at St. Michael's Ukrainian Catholic Parish Hall, 4017 Victoria Avenue in Nanaimo. For information about their upcoming year-end concert on Sunday, May 26th, follow their Facebook page or email visnadancers at gmail.com. On Saturdays at 6 p.m., tune in to the Vancouver edition of Nash Holos on AM 1320 or streaming online at am1320.com. As well, the international edition airs on AM, FM, shortwave and satellite radio in over 20 countries on the PCJ radio network. And here in Nanaimo, Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio broadcasts live every Wednesday to the north and central Vancouver Island, Gulf Island, Sunshine Coast, northwest Washington State, and greater Vancouver listening areas. So at 11 a.m. every Wednesday, please join me, Pavlina, and at 12 noon, okay. Sana for two hours of the best in Ukrainian news, folklore, and music here on CHLY Radio Malaspina 101.7 FM on the radio dial and streaming online at chly.ca. In between broadcasts, make sure to follow Nash Holos and Oksana and me on Facebook and Twitter. And for audio archives, transcripts, podcast feeds, and more, visit our website at www.nashholos.com. <music> of medleys of folk songs for you there by the Ukrainian Prairie Band from right here in the Fraser Valley and Lubostok from Ukraine. Zyuhodienu bula z vame Pavlina. Nahadu ju vysluchite radio pratamu naš holos radio naša hokurinja. Zalašajte si zname na stupnu hodienu. Dali peradiju mikrofonu Oksani. Zaprošu ju posluchite troche pro istoriju i tradeciji rozpovist Oksana. Ale peritem jo hoću zalašite vas te kime slovame mudroste. Kto popiksja na harjačemu, to i na holodne dmuhaja. And our proverb of the week translates as, He who burned himself blows even on something that is cold. And that brings us to the end of the first hour of Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio here on CHLY 101.7 FM in Nanaimo. Please stay with us as Oksana takes over the microphone to host the next hour. Meanwhile, please join me here again next Wednesday from 11 a.m. till 12 noon. And until then, do stay in touch with both Oksana and me via our Facebook page and Twitter. In between podcasts, visit us online where you'll find transcripts in the podcast feed, guest interviews, and other features, and that's at www.nashholos.com. So stay tuned next for the Nash Holos Ukrainian Hour with Oksana, followed by Wellness Wednesday, to learn how to be healthy naturally. And at 2 p.m., join Gord Bibby for two hours of great oldies on Groovin' with Bibby G. I'm Pavlina. Thanks so much for listening. Do <laughs> 